It's not the way it used to be. So with that being said, why don't you grab your Bible and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. You found on your, in your bulletin or on your chair a map that really takes care of the time of 1 Samuel and the life of David. You might want to tuck that in your Bible when we make a reference to these other cities and areas. You'll have a better idea where we're at. What amazing story it is up to this point. Remember Hannah, her prayer of chapter 1, a prayer of desperation because she was at a place where she just felt like things weren't going very good for her. She was barren. She hadn't had a child. Everybody and her brother seems to have been making fun of her. And, and we've all been there when we've been ridiculed. You know, we don't quite live up to the standards of what other people had. And what she did, what we saw is so important, she took it to the Lord. And she humbled herself and prayed, and, and we saw God answer that prayer. As she, at the end of chapter 1, we saw her uh, bring forth a child, and he called his name Samuel. And then in chapter 2, we see, I think, the one of the most fantastic prayers of the Bible. In fact, it's one of those great prayers that it's probably, you know, in the Old Testament, the best prophecy concerning the life of Jesus Christ, the birth and the life, and the fact that our King of Kings is coming back again. And so that's kind of where we're at. We have Samuel now over at Eli. We're living with Eli. Eli was a high priest at that time where his life was now dedicated to the Lord and Samuel being a young man. Verse 1, and the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the Lord uh, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation. Otherwise, as you remember, where, how, what was the state? What was the spiritual state of the nation? What was the spiritual uh, state of the nation uh, of the Jews that were living there? We had since the time of Joshua. Remember the generation after Joshua. It tells it told us that there rose a generation who knew not the Lord, and that spiritual condition continued during the time of Judges. They would do well for a period. They would have a you know just a temporary revival when a, they got themselves in trouble and finally they repented and they turned to the Lord and then they were back doing where they were, uh, what they wanted to do, even as judges told us that men and women were doing what they seem and what they thought was right in their own mind. L instead of God's word, and let it, instead of God being that what would direct us, they were allowing their own lives to be that. And so the word of God was empty, is another way to look at it. There, there was no revelation, and it came to pass, it tells us in verse 2, at the time when Eli was lying down in, the, in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, he, and, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle, the Lord was where the ark of, of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. And so he, so he ran, and Eli said, Here I am, for you've called me. And so this lad, this young guy, started hearing this voice. And this time was probably closer to the morning because the lamp of God was to be there lit all through the evening, and so probably like the twilight of the morning. And so he started hearing this voice. And then it tells us, as he goes on, and he said, I did not call, lie down again. And, and, I, and he went and lay down. In verse 6, it says, Then the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, but for you called me. And he answers, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, uh, nor was the word of the Lord revealed to him. Really what we're seeing here is that Samuel wasn't of age yet. He was still a very young lad where he really wasn't responding to the voice of God and understanding that God's call upon him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So three times he's calling uh, Samuel. And he rose and he went to, to Eli. And Eli said, here I am for you did call me. And Eli perceived 
that the Lord had called the boy. It's a beautiful thing that Eli at this point, and we don't know too much about Eli other than his sons were very wicked, right? We saw that even last week. But it perceives that he, I mean, the best we could tell, he wasn't a bad guy, but he just wasn't very spiritually in tune. But he finally says, you know what, there's something going on here. He says, it must be the Lord. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel in verse 9, Go and lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. You know, when I see that verse, I think and try to think of us in our life. Is God still speaking today? I believe that he speaks to us each and every day. But are we willing to hear? I think what's unfortunately fortunate for most churches around, a lot of believers, they have what I think is called spiritual wax in the ear. When you ever get where your ears are plugged up, even though God might be speaking, they've become dull to the work of the Holy Spirit and they're not hearing the work of God and the Spirit of God leading and guiding their life. The most important thing that I need in my life and that I believe that all of us need is to hear the voice of God, hear the voice of the Lord leading us and guiding us. The thing that Jesus has said so beautiful when he looked at us, and I'm one of all of us, he's called a sheep, didn't he? And he says, my sheep do what? They hear my voice. So the question tonight is, are you hearing the voice of Jesus? Are we responding to that voice and listening to that voice? And now the Lord came in verse 10 and stood and called at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. God's not stuttering there in case you're wondering. He's saying it for attention, to get his attention. And Samuel answered, and he said, speak for your servant here. So, you know, that's the thing that's so beautiful is that when our prayer, I ever think that prayer is a two-way street? That we, uh, so often prayer, we spend our time making our petitions before God, but are we taking time in prayer where we hear the voice of God speak to us and how he wants to lead us and give us instruction? And God is speaking. He says, the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears, it will tingle. That's not a really good uh, translation, tingle, here. It's really more like your ears are going to ring. It's like somebody come up behind somebody, and this is, I want to advise you, but as little boys you do this. If maybe you had brothers that would do that. They come up behind you, and they slap the back, both of your ears at the same time, and you would hear this ringing. I says, that's what we're talking about here. He says, they're going to be ringing when they hear what, what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. He says in verse 12, In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and did not restrain themselves. God had risen them up to be priests, to represent the Lord before the people. Back then they were known as priests and nowadays they're known as pastors. And what we have is that privilege as a pastor is to represent the God correctly. These people have become vile and they did not restrain, Eli did not restrain him, them from doing what they should be doing, stopping them. Remember, he, he tried to stop them. He spoke words to them, but they didn't listen. But he had the power. He had the ability to stop them from doing it. And as they, as they were going to the temple, remember, if somebody was bringing something to sacrifice, they would put it out there. And Eli, uh, his sons, would grab the food and take the larger, the best portions for themselves rather than first offering it to the Lord. And then it also tells us there that these guys would lie around the, the opening to the tabernacle. And it tells us that they were laying with the women that were there. You know, this new thing of men being power, as we saw this last year, of taking advantage of women is not a new thing. It's been happening all the way from the time of our story. 
And he says he did not restrain them in verse 14. And therefore I sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquities of Eli's house shall be, uh, be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel laid down until morning. I imagine, can you imagine? He doesn't say he went back to sleep, did he? Probably after hearing those words, he just lay, staring up at the sky. He lay down until morning, and they opened the door of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. He was just a young lad. He heard this, these words, and you can understand why he was fearful at this time. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, here, he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word of the Lord that spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and also, and more also, that if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Can you imagine laying that trip on some young kid? If you don't do it, man, may God strike you, basically what he's saying. And then Samuel told him everything, hid nothing from him, good for him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what it seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. The thing that I noticed about Eli's response, he did say, well, if it's, it's good, if this was God's going to do, then let him do it. What you don't hear of Eli, what you don't see Eli doing in our story is repenting and calling upon the Lord. God is in the business of forgiving, of forgiving people. We mentioned this morning out of the book of Malachi where the prophet just simply says, if you return unto me, says the Lord, I will return unto you. As we see in, the, in 1 John, it tells us that as, as we as believers, if we quench the spirit, if we sin, it tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's in the business of extending his mercy and grace unto everybody. Why do I know that is true? Because of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so Samuel grew in verse 19, and the Lord was with him, and, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Otherwise, the things that he was speaking, and the things that he was speaking is now starting to find favor with people. And then he didn't allow the words of God to fall to the ground. And may we do not, you know, shy away from the word of God, that we're bold with God's word. And he, he and all of Israel from Dan and Bathsheba uh, knew that Samuel had been established as the prophet of the Lord. And then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And again, you can look at your map. You can see it for all the way from Dan up in the northern part or down all the way to Bathsheba to the southern part. And, and then you can find Sh uh, Shiloh there in the center. In chapter 4, we find something very interesting where the ark of God gets captured. How in the world could anybody lose the ark of God? We'll find out. Verse 1, now Israel went to battle against the Philistine and encamped beside Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. And then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistine, who killed about 400,000 or 4,000 of their army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, uh, the elders of Israel say, said, Why has the Lord defeated us this day before the Philistines? I think it's really ironic that they're blaming God for the defeat. I think we're quick to blame God when things go bad in our life rather than owning up to our own responsibility to the mistakes that we make. I, even when Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. If you reap to the flesh, what's going to happen? You're going to reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. If God's going to be for you. He's going to bless you. But they're blaming God because the, this <laughs> catastrophe came upon them. But as we've seen in their history, they haven't been living for God. 
They only wanted God's help when problems came. Let us bring, now that some smart guy, I don't know who this guy was, also came up with this idea. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it might save us from the hand of our enemies. Notice what they're looking for to save them. It says, it might save us. What's the it? The Ark of the Covenant. They were looking at that as almost like a, a magic a charm. As I mentioned this morning, I had myself a lucky charm that I thought I had as a young boy. You ever have a rabbit's foot? I used to carry a rabbit's foot with me, and I thought I was really, you know, going to be, everything's going to go my way. Well, it never quite went all my way, all, all the way that I thought it was, should be, especially with the time it came rope, report cards, and I went home and showed my parents my rabbit's foot didn't help me that much. But we have a tendency to want to look at relics. You know, even today, a lot of people want to look at icons, images, and look for them to have power of some sort rather than God himself. Isn't that such a false substitute that we could look at a thing rather than to the God that created us? And that's what they're doing. They're looking at these things. And so they went, you know, it tells us here, it says, you know, why has the Lord defeated us? And it tells us why in verse 4. So the people said to Shiloh that they might bring from them the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord uh, of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, was there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. I think it's interesting. It's almost like it, these guys are getting all along with the parade that's coming into town, Right. This is an opportunity for these guys. They're as corrupt as could be. They had a, a, a chance to be in the limelight again. He says, yeah, let's go. Let's go to the battle. Let's bring the ark. That's our job. They weren't doing the job all along, were they? There's something how what God wants, when God wants to bless men and women in the ministry, which all of you guys have been called into the ministry, it's that little word of faithfulness. Faithfulness in the small things. Faithfulness to serve the Lord when nobody's looking, where nobody cares. These guys, I think, were just looking for the spotlights to be upon them. And there's a real danger that's just to have a, your spotlights that always want to be about you and the, the great things that you could do rather than talking about Jesus Christ. Help us always to be like him. I was reminded as I saw see Ed's dog go walking out the door, uh, my dog, when I was a young boy, not a young boy, actually uh, 17, 18 years old or so around there, I was living in Minnesota, and I had one of the most beautiful Irish setters that you could ever have. It would always go. It was my brother's dog, but he, the Vietnam was in session, and he was overseas with that, and so he asked me to take care of his dog, and we would go out in the field, and that dog would see a pheasant or something, boom, it would point. Later on in life, I asked the Lord, what have you called me to do in ministry? And that always kept coming back to my mind. In ministry, what God has called each and every one of us to do is to, for us to point people to Jesus, to point people to his word, and to point people to prayer. And that way, he gets the glory. And may we be like that and not like these guys that are seeking to get the limelight and the spotlight upon themselves. Verse 5. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. And, and, and you can imagine, you were just defeated yesterday. You don't have much hope, but all of a sudden you see the Ark coming, and you see these priests coming. Things are going to be good. It, it shook. And now, verse 6, now when the Philistines heard it, they weren't that far away across the valley. He said, when they heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean, then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into camp. Probably somebody had spied it out. Somebody saw it come into the camp. And these guys were wondering what was going on. And they said to us, as they said, God has come into the camp. And so the enemies recognized that ark was representing the Lord and they said that God had come into the camp. Big difference than what they were looking for, isn't it? 
And God was coming into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us who will deliver us from the hand of of the mighty gods. They didn't get that. They didn't understand that the God of the Hebrews was one God. The Lord our God is what? Is one God, is one Lord. There's only one but yet they saw because in their religion and what they learned is they, they had multiple gods. He says, these are the gods that, who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Uh, be strong and conduct yourself like, like men, who you Philistines, that you do not become a servants of the Hebrews as they have been, have been to you. Conduct yourself like men and fight. Otherwise, you don't want to go into servitude. servitude. You don't want to become a slave. This, you know, it's time to buckle up and fight. I got a feeling there's something about our bodies when we have something to do that for a period of time, there's almost like a, you ever been there where a super adrenaline comes upon you? And I think they, these guys are experiencing that. Their backs are up against the wall. They feel like, okay, that ark's over there. God's going to wipe us out. In, in verse 10, it says, So the Philistines fought, and as Israel, Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. What a defeat! They look to the ark of God to be their, the one that they're going to trust in rather than looking to God. And I don't know if that needed to happen if they would have simply repented and called. One thing that we see absent during their defeat is what? Is prayer. Amen. Calling upon the Lord. And also it tells us in verse 11, also the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hopini and Phinehas, died. So we finally get rid of those guys out of the picture. The prophecy said, as we saw in chapter 2, that these, God was going to wipe these guys out. Then a man of the Benj- Benjamin ran from the battle line that same day and came to uh, Shiloh, and his clothes were torn and, his, uh, uh, and dirt on his head. And that was very typical when there was a time of grief. They would rip their clothes off and they would throw dust up in the air. It it was a really a sign of the sorrow that they were going through. But it just tells us, it doesn't tell us his name. It was just a guy, somebody. And how God was using this man to be part of the ministry that God had given him to go and speak to Eli. In verse 13, and when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat. By the, by, by the wayside, watching, for his heart was trembling for the ark of God. He knew it wasn't right that the ark would leave, but yet he allowed it to go. So he's sitting there probably, you know, upset, stressing over the fact that he didn't listen to God and he didn't tell those boys that, he, that they shouldn't allow the ark to be gone. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he says, What does the sound of the tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told, told Eli. And Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he says, What happened? My son. So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistine, and there was a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophenes and Phinehas, uh, Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Very tragic day. Well, let me go back to this man. I think it's amazing, and it's really a principle that that we see in the New Testament about speaking, speaking the truth. The Bible tells us that we as believers, we should speak the truth in love with the boldness no matter who we are. Here's this young guy that he was just a messenger, but he was able with the boldness to go speak these bad news to the high priests. That took quite a bit of boldness, didn't it? But yet he did. 
And so he told him the ark has been captured. And then it happened in verse 18. When he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off his, the seat backwards by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy and he judged Israel for 40 years. I, one thing I love about the Bible, how, how it paints pictures for us, doesn't it? We're, we're at the tabernacle. He's at the gate. He's just been waiting for them to get news. He hears this news. It was so overwhelming. He leans back. He just keeps on rolling, doesn't he? And a prophecy concerning Eli and his sons are now fulfilled. But now there is one more story that we want to look at here tonight. It's a story called Ichabod, beginning in verse 19. It says, Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child due to be delivered. And when she heard at the news of that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bow, bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And it was about time of her, uh, of her death, the woman stood, who's, uh, a woman who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have born a son. And so this midwife was wanting to come along and give her some new good news that, you know, in the midst of all this grief, you, you have some good news, you have a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named this, the child Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel. Sad name. The name your child Ichabod that God's glory has left. You know, it, it, the sad thing that we see here in this story is a story that gets told over and over and over again, especially in church history, even near history and far history, where they start a good work of God. And Paul writes about it. He says the things that start in the Spirit, for some reason or another, we think that we were going to make it perfect in the flesh. As we strive and we try to make things happen, what happens so often is that the Spirit of God leaves. And we stop loving one another. As we looked at it this morning, it's a very short read, but you might want to read Revelation chapter 2. As you see the story of the seven churches... And Jesus, in the midst of those seven churches, and there's, you know, you, you want to picture it. He says he's walking in the midst of these candlesticks. And can you picture this room right now? If there were seven candlesticks in the different corners and around in the place, and Jesus walking in the midst of it. And he's told Ephesus, he says, I know your works. I know that you are doing things. And many churches are doing laborious things, and they, they consider good things for the gospel. But he said, I have one thing against you. What was that? That you left your first love. And then he's told him, he says, you need to remember the first, uh, the first art. And then you need to, second one, the first R meant. And the second one is to repent. And the third one is you need to go back and, uh, and redo the things that you've done in the past. And Jesus said, if you don't do that, I'm going to come up to this candlestick over here. And I'm going to take it out. Ichabod gets stole, told over and over again where the Spirit of God lives. He will not stay in a loveless church. Not only as you look at the nation here, the nation of Israel, where they were supposed to represent the Lord, and they did not. So what happens? The Spirit of God exits. And also it happens to churches, but also happens to individuals when they no longer are about Jesus, where church becomes more their tradition of what they do. Jesus is always about a relationship. Christianity is about a relationship with God, and it's a love relationship. And if we find ourselves to get in, you know, st I don't know how to say it, but absent of joy, absent of love, absent of peace, I would take a serious look at what John said there in Re Revelation, that we just simply return. And if you find yourself empty of peace and joy and love this week, 
Because that's what God has given us and wants us to experience. May we just simply return to our first love. As he said, he said this woman said, Call my child Ichabod, saying that the glory of, has departed from Israel because the ark was captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the, the ark of God had been captured. So sad. You know, and I think even as, as I thought about this, Jesus walking in, in, in amongst his church. As he sees the church worldwide and he sees the, the individuals that make up the church. Of course, the church is not a building. It never has been a building. You know, the church is about individuals. I wonder if as he looks at the church, as he looks down or wherever he is, he sees on the forehead of individuals the name written on them, Ichabod. Because the spirit has left. God wants to fill us with his spirit. He wants us to know our love. But if we keep ourselves so caught up in the traditions of man and we continue to play Christianity rather than live in it, I believe that name is written upon us. May God will never, ever allow that to happen to us. How do you do it? How do you keep yourself from that name being talked about you? You just fall in love with Jesus day by day. Don't allow anything to get in the way. Your walk with the Lord. Again, as I mentioned this morning, a band from many, many years ago had a, a lyrics of, of a song that I love so much. It, it's just a simple lyrics. It, they used to sing, I've got Jesus, and that's enough. May we sing and allow that ring within our hearts that we would love Jesus, and we'll, we'll say no to the things of the world. I've got Jesus. And that's enough. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, Father? We